from the crossroads of the West <laughs> at the Salt Lake City Library. We welcome you to the ninth Racket Con. We've just finished a very exciting week of the Racket Summer School, where we had the How to Design Language Languages Workshop, and we also had the first uh, edition of the Beautiful Racket Workshop. A lot of the people here were there, and I hope you had a great time this past week. <laughs> Today we have, um, our plan is to have some, some news and celebration of the exciting things happening in the racket world. Um, tomorrow we'll be having a hackathon where we'll be doing um, a state of the racket address from Matthew Flatt, as well as um, a, a game jam and a new thing, a lang jam. This will actually not be in this space. It'll be at the University of Utah uh, where the summer school was. The link is on the page. Um, we're going to start off today um, with a talk from uh, Aaron Turin who's at Mozilla Research, and he'll be talking to us about um, the way that uh, the Rust project organizes themselves, and I think that we have a lot that we can learn from them. Um, and please welcome Aaron to the stage. Hey, everybody. Uh, I wanted to start by saying it's really special to be here at RacketCon. Um, although I've never been deeply involved in the Racket community, I have been Racket adjacent for a really long time. Uh, so I went to grad school at Northeastern University uh, where Matthias and Sam, Vincent, Jesse, and a bunch of other people uh, around here uh, were. And I did a little bit of Racket hacking, but mostly just sort of watched in awe at the amazing things they were doing. Um, but my life sort of took a different path, and uh, I ended up working at Mozilla on the Rust programming language. And I want to just briefly uh, give you an overview of what Rust is. This will be really the only technical piece of the talk, but just to sort of set the stage a little bit. Um, but then I'm going to spend most of the time talking about um, sort of my biggest passion in the Rust world, which is how we run a large and successful open source language. Um, and I think there's a lot you know, that will translate. There's probably some that won't. But the most important thing I want to do is raise some of the questions that we've come to ask uh, as we've been structuring the Rust community. So before talking about what is Rust, um, the first question is kind of why Rust and why Mozilla? Uh, and this goes back a while now. But the premise is pretty simple. Web browsers, uh, Mozilla makes Firefox, in case you weren't aware. Um, web browsers are many operating systems. They're also, in a lot of ways, sort of the, the front gate between your machine and the open internet. Um, so it's really important that they be secure. Um, but on the other hand, it's really important that they perform extremely well. Right? So browsers compete on both of these dimensions. And most uh, mainstream browsers today are written largely in C++. Um, but C++ has a lot of downsides. In particular, it emphasizes uh, sort of control, low-level performance over safety. You know, there are some safety features, but it's very easy to get it wrong, so we get browser exploits all the time. So at Mozilla Research, um, the idea was to start a not very ambitious project where we would introduce both a new programming language and build a browser engine from scratch um, on, this, on this language. I really don't understand how this snuck past management, um, <laughs> but I'm really glad it did. Um, and it's gone really well. So, so the idea for Rust was to be a new systems level programming language, sort of comparable to C++, but taking uh, memory safety and thread safety and other forms of, you know, of safety very, very seriously. Um, and then Servo was the experimental browser engine. And I'm happy to say now, um, most of the things that were initially built in Servo have actually made their way into Firefox. So Firefox is increasing the amount of Rust code and decreasing the amount of C++ code every year. Um, so just not to leave you completely in the dark, um, I'll just run through a couple of the quick technical points about what Rust looks like as a language. Um, and I think 
in, in a lot of ways, it's a very opposite language to Racket, um, but there are definitely some similarities, right? So number one, it is a, it is a low level language. It's really important that it doesn't have uh, a big runtime. It doesn't have a garbage collector. You can take, you can basically put Rust code anywhere that you could put C code. Um, and, and that's been a really important principle. Um, so you, ha you also have control over memory layout, which is really important for performance. On the other hand, unlike C++ and other existing systems language, languages, um, Rust is very strongly typed, um, not just in the traditional way, but also with an ownership system. I won't really talk much in detail, but that's kind of the secret sauce for Rust. It's what makes it possible to work at this low level, but still have the compiler sort of check what you're doing and make sure that it is actually memory safe. It also is a very modern language in the sense that uh, it, it incorporated right off the bat a lot of the best ideas from functional programming, things like pattern matching, uh, type classes from Haskell, and, and many other things. And there's also a strong emphasis on tooling. So when Rust 1.0 was shipped, it came with uh, a very good package manager sort of on day one. Um, we've put a lot of work into compiler errors, which are really necessary when you're dealing with all these new concepts around ownership that can be hard to get your mind around. Um, so part of what I want to get across here is that um, there are really a lot of requirements and a lot of things we're trying to do at once with Rust. Like we are very serious about this language. We want it to see mainstream use beyond just Firefox, right? We want to be able to hire Rust developers to work on Firefox, um, which is now possible. Uh, and to get there, we really needed to look at the whole picture and not just you know, one piece of language design. Okay, so that's, that ends the technical portion. The, the rest of the talk is, in a way, a uh, walk through the history of Rust, um, and also a walk through my own personal involvement in it. Um, and Rust really has three, at least three different eras. You could, you could break the pre-1.0 era up further if you wanted. Um, but these, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to structure the talk around these three eras, and uh, as we go through, I'll explain sort of what I mean by the titles on each of these. Um, but let me start with sort of the run-up to Rust 1.0, which uh, happened in May of 2015. So before Rust 1.0, uh, Rust was developed in a very open way, and also we had no idea what we were doing. Um, so when Rust first started out as a personal project of one engineer at Mozilla, uh, it looked a lot more like Go than it does today. Um, but one of the really cool things that emerged early on in Rust development and the Rust community is an uh, appetite for iteration and breaking all of the code that used to work on top of the Rust compiler. Right? So for, for several years, it was like every week you got a new version of the compiler, something broke, you had to update your code. But somehow we managed to form enough of a community around this that people were actually updating their code and giving feedback. And this was really important to try to figure out what this language was supposed to be, right? We knew, we knew what the ultimate goals were in terms of impacting Firefox, but it wasn't clear how that would actually translate to language design. And so at first we had a garbage collector, you know, at first we had built-in message passing and all these other things, and that shifted over time. So Rust 1.0 was really about reaching a point of stability where we were finally able to say, your code will continue running next week um, and next year and the year after that. And getting there took a lot of uh, people management work. And so that, that's really what I want to talk about. You might be familiar with Wadler's Law. Um, Phil Wadler, of course, is famous in the Haskell community, but this applies pretty much to any language. Uh, and, and basically it says that um, the less important you know, more or less, the less important a thing is, the more people get upset about it, or sort of the more superficial it is, the more people get upset. Um, and this is kind of true. Uh, I bring this up mostly because the examples I'm gonna give are indeed examples that focus on things like lexical syntax. Um, but in my mind, those are sort of the most obvious case studies about how to structure community discussion. And you can learn from those cases to figure out how to do better when you have discussions around semantics or sort of deeper questions. I also happen to think syntax is really important. Uh, right, so 
here's where I enter the picture. Um, so this would have been, I guess, 2014. Uh, and my job initially at Mozilla was to work on the standard library uh, and try to get it, whip it into shape for some kind of 1.0 release. Um, and it turns out like this was partly a technical problem, but this was actually mostly a people problem. Um, and so very naively, you know, I started working my way through the library and had some ideas about you know, renaming this or changing that or whatever. Um, and I met with pushback really quickly, right? So I, I make a pull request that tries to do a rename and I get this pushback that you can see here. Um, but very self-righteously, I'm like, well, there was a procedure, right? We had a meeting um, <laughs> and we made a decision and we took into account all of the feedback on these various threads, right? So, to, to set the stage a little bit more here, at this time, um, you know, most of the decisions around Rust were basically made by Mozilla employees. So even though it was seen as a very open language with lots of contributors and a, and a strong community, the decision-making was actually quite closed and really did take place in these closed-door meetings at Mozilla. Um, so I remember you know, waking up to this GitHub thread with like 60 comments on it where everybody was losing their mind over this renaming thing. Um, thankfully, uh, Nico Matsakis, uh, who will feature a few times in this talk, um, my great colleague at Mozilla, he stepped in and said, okay, okay, we hear you. We understand that the process we're using is sort of not taking into account all of the stakeholders, so we're gonna rewind and actually make a more formal proposal around doing this renaming. Um, and it was really interesting how quickly the response shifted, right? It, this immediately brought a lot more trust um, from the community and you know, people's, people's bad feelings sort of turned into good feelings. Um, but this was not the first time we would have to learn this kind of lesson in the community. So fast forward a little bit, now, now we're getting uh, you know, I've written now scads of RFCs for all kinds of, that's requests for comments, for all kinds of um, features in the library. We're getting close to actually shipping 1.0, but there are a few niggling details, like the name of the integer type, um, which of course the community had been discussing on a GitHub issue for probably two years, 300 comments. Um, we needed to make a decision. So again, we thought we were doing the right thing. Um, the sort of core team of deciders skimmed through this thread, tried to take into account all this feedback. We then wrote up a big post with lots of rationale about why we thought it should be named this and not that, and same thing happened, okay? But here I, I have to thank um, Gabor, um, who's this little cat avatar from the Rust community, um, for really clearly articulating to us what was going wrong here, which was that, you know, here we have this two-year-old thread that the community has been participating in really strongly this whole time. And then we have the people who make the decisions who basically never left any comments on that thread. We walk in at the end and we say, okay, we saw what you discussed and here's our decision. Um, and that just didn't sit right with people and I think for good reason, right? It, it feels very exclusionary. It's not clear how to have any influence on the direction of the language. And so we basically ended up taking the same tack as before, um, started over from the beginning, actually participated in the discussion, and wound up changing our decision in the end um, after fully digesting the community's rationale. Right, so, you know, again, these may seem like fairly minor questions of naming or syntax, and at some level they are, but like I say, those, those discussions are sort of the templates for much harder discussions you're gonna have later. You can learn a lot from all of the flaming um, that can happen if things go wrong. Okay, so what, what is this dynamic? What's going on here? Uh, so I'm gonna give you three acronyms over the course of the talk. The first one is WWIC, why wasn't I consulted? Um, and I, I really love this, this essay. If you haven't read it, I highly encourage you to, to look it up um, from Paul Ford. Um, but basically, what the essay is trying to get at is what makes the internet different from other mediums that have existed in the past. And one of the things that makes it different is this kind of democratizing nature of it, that if you have an open comment forum, anybody can say anything at any time. And 
there comes with this a, somewhat a sense of entitlement that what I say should matter to whoever you know, is listening on the other side of the forum. And you, know, you can view this in a way where you're sort of scoffing at it like, oh, those, those entitled internet users, whatever, we don't care about them. Um, but in Rust, um, we sort of started from the get-go with a philosophy of we really care what people have to say, um, all, what anybody has to say. And so understanding this why wasn't I consulted aspect of the internet led us to create a bunch of structures, you know, more formal structures for how decisions are made, how the project runs, um, you know, that are more clear that include people sort of from the get-go. So this notion of an RFC, um, we have a GitHub repo for RFCs. Anybody can open a pull request and make a proposal about anything. And these proposals don't just cover things like language design. They cover uh, compiler architecture, tooling APIs. Uh, they cover how to run conferences, what kinds of uh, guidelines for conduct we want in the community. You name it. Anything about the Rust project or community is fair game. Um, when it comes to technical questions, the goal in a thread that results around an RFC is to, to sort of lay out the whole space of trade-offs, right? Obviously, not everybody's going to agree on how to assign values to trade-offs, but hopefully we can all work together to figure out what trade-offs are being made in a particular design. Uh, and so then the, the role of the sort of official team that ultimately makes the decision is to guide that community conversation to some kind of steady state where the trade-offs are clear, and now, now it's fair game for the team to apply their values and figure out what, what way to fall on those trade-offs. Um, but hopefully everybody can agree on what the trade-offs are. There's also a notion of a final comment period. So basically when we feel like we've reached that steady state, the team is uh, about ready to make a decision, the RFC gets flagged, as entering final comment period that lasts for a week, trying to accommodate you know, people who have busy work schedules and so on. And that's just a, a last chance to sort of get some idea in if it hasn't already occurred on the thread. And there have been many times where during that final comment period, somebody like Gabor will step in and point out a flaw that we had missed. Um, the final point that I think is very, very important and goes back to that second example, um, is what we call the no new rationale rule. Um, and this rule basically says that when we make a decision, that decision can't include a bunch of new rationale um, that hasn't already been you know, fleshed out on the thread. And that, that's how we sort of separate out, you know, going back to Gabor's comment that everybody else just has to leave comments and why do you get to come in and, and sort of hand down the decision with your own rationale. The team has to already make the case on the thread, the thread has to reach steady state, and then they can make a decision, right? So this is, this is how we help force ourselves to listen, which is really freaking hard. Okay, so I wanna draw a contrast um, between this way of doing open source and some of the more traditional ways, right? So here's a quote from the Apache Software Foundation um, about their approach to reaching consensus on decisions. Um, so they call this lazy consensus, and basically, it's like, ah, if you think you have a good idea, write some code, try to land it. Um, if, if the reviewer likes it, great. It's all under source control, so if the community ultimately decides they don't want it, you can always take it out, right? I think this is pretty naive. Um, at least it certainly doesn't work in the Rust community. And so I think what we're striving for is a kind of eager consensus approach where it's not okay to just go off and write a big pile of code and expect it to be reviewed and merged. There needs to be some eager, explicit consensus process. Um, it doesn't have to be a big heavyweight thing, but you need to say, hey, Rust community, here's a thing I'm thinking about doing. Let's get some feedback and get the ball rolling. So to sort of wrap up the why wasn't I consulted piece, um, I think really what what we're getting at is a number of important questions that any community needs to ask. You know, you don't have to have the same answers to these questions as Rust does, but you should have clear answers, right? So who are the stakeholders for decisions? Like, who, who actually matters? Does everyone on the internet matter? Do, you know, only production users matter? How much do early adopters matter? Um, 
also, who, who is the product for, right? This may or may not be the same as the stakeholder questions. Um, who makes the decisions, right? In Rust's case, ultimately, we have these designated formal teams, um, but we have all these checks to make sure that they're listening to the community. And then the, the really tough one is, okay, if we're doing all of this work to try to listen and discuss and reach consensus, that is a long process. It can be very tiring, um, and it often is seen as in opposition to shipping, right? Sometimes the team feels like, we know what we wanna do, we just can't seem to rally the community around it. It would be a lot nicer if we could just go ahead and land code and ship it. And again, many decisions are valid here. For Rust, we landed more on the side of inclusion than shipping, although as, as we'll go through the talk, I'll show you ways that we have swung the pendulum back towards shipping without losing the inclusion. Okay, so did all this work? I think for this part, for this era, the answer is very clearly yes. Like the fact that we managed to ship Rust 1.0 is still amazing to me. Um, and we only did it because we were able to, to rally the community around these consensus processes. Um, I also you know, can give you dozens of examples where there were ideas or flaws that the team missed that were caught by random people um, from the internet who happened to hop on a thread, right? So uh, it definitely improved the product. And I think Rust, a big part of Rust's success has been the volume of uh, its volunteer community. And a big part of that is that when you get involved in Rust as a volunteer, you genuinely feel like you have a say in the direction of language. You genuinely feel like you can impact uh, how the language is taking shape. And that's extremely exciting to people. It's what has kept a lot of volunteers around all these years. Um, but I really can't emphasize enough that this is super hard, super tiring work. All right, um, so we shipped Rust 1.0. Um, to get there, right, we were trying to make a bunch of promises around stability that we wouldn't break code, which meant that we had to cut a lot of things that we were not so sure about, try to get it down to this core. After we shipped Rust 1.0, we switched gears and said, okay, a lot of those cuts kind of hurt. Like Rust is not as nice to use as it could be. So now we want to focus on building on that foundation and making it a more productive language. Uh, and a big part of this too is trying to shift the audience for Rust, right? We had a, a strong community of enthusiasts and early adopters, and that's great. It, you know, they're the lifeblood of the project, but we wanted to be more ambitious in who we reached. We wanted to be able to have, you know, uh, career JavaScript programmers suddenly be able to write systems level code, right? That was, that was our ambition. Um, and doing that was not easy, um, again, um, but for somewhat different reasons from the Rust 1.0 situation, right? So after 1.0, there was this kind of weird period where we no longer had that really clear, crisp goal of shipping 1.0. Like, we did it, what's next? And lots of people had lots of ideas, right? So there were tons of threads where, you know, basically people were calling out whatever one feature they thought was really important and being like flabbergasted that the entire community wasn't totally focused on this feature. Um, here comes Nico again, right? So. Nico tried to lay out from a leadership perspective what he thought the um, priorities after 1.0 should be. But there's a little bit of a problem with this post, um, which is that it was really long. <laughs> um, so like, it wasn't wrong. Like basically everything in here has either happened or is still on a roadmap somewhere. Like he had the right ideas, but this is not something that you can rally people around, right? This is a laundry list. To rally a community, you need a clear vision. Um, and you know, this, this idea of cat herding, I think, again, going back to old school open source, right? There's this notion that, um, oh, open source works by each developer kind of doing their own thing. Whatever thing is bothering them, they implement that and fix that. And you know, I mean, lots of software has been created that way, but we really wanted to have a very coherent and clean product. Um, and so it wasn't gonna work for us for people to just land whatever features they thought were best. Um, so how do we get all of these people who do have itches to scratch 
to sort of itch the same way, um, uh, sort of itch in alignment. Um, and so that's, that's like, that leads to the second acronym, ATV, articulate the vision. Um, right, so the point here is somewhat, you know, somewhat emotional, right? You need, if you're gonna get people, like the, the whole idea of scratching your itch is like there's something that's bugging you that's gonna motivate you to do work. Um, and we wanted to find a different source of motivation, which, which meant that we really needed to get people excited about solving a common problem or going in a common direction, um, or even sort of thinking in a common way. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with values, uh, which really was the hardest part of this era of Rust, because the people we had in the community at that time were mostly diehard, very experienced system programmers who weren't that interested in lowering the barrier to entry for other people. And in fact, their big concern was if you, if you make things, you know, if you add implicitness or you make things like too smooth and easy, then you'll start missing important things, right? You'll start making mistakes. So there was that tension. And those systems programmers are important and we wanna take them seriously, but we need to figure out how to broaden anyway. Um, so what we wound up doing, uh, and this, this actually started with the run up to Rust 1.0, but really kicked in after, was trying to distill these values and this vision down to slogans uh, that people could easily understand that could really resonate and get people excited. Right, so for Rust 1.0, the slogan was stability without stagnation, meaning we wanted, we wanted a story where we could promise not to break code, but still continue the iterative development process um, that had worked so well for us. And I won't go into the details on how we did that, but the, the slogan sort of says the trade-off that, that we're trying to navigate. Um, and then more generally, this, this issue of what is Rust? Who is Rust's audience? Um, what kinds of programmers should be able to use it? You know, this, this slogan, hack without fear, was a really good distillation of what we were trying to do, that Rust empowers you to do programming, you know, maybe at a lower level than you would be comfortable doing before, or if you were a systems programmer, it is trying to let you be more ambitious with what you do, right? It has something for everybody, but the key thing is that whatever it is you're afraid of, Rust is helping you be less afraid. And then the final one, which is really what s sort of um, put the cap on this era, was saying that we knew at Rust 1.0 we had a language that was fast and reliable, but it wasn't productive. And so our, our stated goal for that time um, was to make productivity sort of an equal player and an equal value. Okay, so, so we have these slogans, and a lot of those just came out in blog posts from leaders and so on. And that's step one around getting people inspired. But we also wanted to formalize this, this vision setting aspect of the community. And so we ended up doing this through an annual roadmap process. Uh, so the, the roadmap basically lays out, okay, for this year, what do we as a community want to get done? Tries to give a sort of capsule like slogan version of that, but then break down in some level of detail, still pretty high level, but some level of detail what this actually means, right? So for 2016, uh, you know, the roadmap was talking about productivity, but then that broke down to, okay, well, with the language, we're gonna pursue some ideas in this space, and with documentation, we're gonna do these things, and, and so on. So this wasn't committing to particular technical decisions, or even a strong commitment to strategy, but it sort of, it gave an, an overview of where we wanted to head. Um, we used the RFC process for these roadmaps as well, right, so they're generally written and, and in fact, these days, we, before the roadmap appears, we send a call to the entire community for blog posts, um, for people to give their own take. And then the, the leadership reads all of those blog posts, tries to synthesize uh, a roadmap RFC, and then the community discusses it. Um, one of the best things about this roadmap process is that it makes it a lot easier to say no to people. Because it can be pretty clear, like, hey, that's a great idea, but it's not on the roadmap. And I think, you know, an underlying theme here, um, which was already there in Why Wasn't I Consulted, but it's even more here with articulating the vision, um, is that we take a very pluralistic stance. We think that you don't have to have the exact same values as Rust leadership to get something out of Rust and to contribute to Rust. 
but we are going to try to give a coherent vision and set of values um, that, that the leadership is trying to push toward, right? And so you can kind of judge for yourself, like, how much overlap do I have with these values that, that they're putting out there? If there's really no overlap, then maybe Rust is not for you. Um, but there's a lot of room to, you know, to differ at least a little bit from these values. Right, um, so I, I've kind of been alluding to this along the way, but a big push um, for productivity was to make the language more ergonomic, um, which people started throwing around the term magic uh, on GitHub issues, and it, that became basically a hammer that people could use to try to get leadership in trouble uh, if we were, you know, from our perspective, trying to make the language easier, from their perspective, making it easier to make mistakes. Right, and so this was, this was a really hard balance to try to strike. And again, it has to do with um, expanding the audience. So after the roadmap process and the big vision, then we have to execute on it and, and turn it into technical decisions. And this also needs more articulation of vision. Right, this, this was the hardest thing of, of this era. Um, and this is a snippet from a, a blog post I wrote, basically trying to push back against this hand wavy idea of, oh, that's too magic, and give a more crisp way of actually analyzing a, a language feature that had some implicit aspects to figure out when is that going to go wrong, when is that reasonably safe to do, right? Uh, and so it's just saying, here are these different dimensions you can analyze. This is the kind of thing we should be looking for. And this rubric was pretty helpful in going through particular proposals where now you know, instead of somebody posts something about magic and it gets 50 thumbs up and the discussion basically comes to a close, you can say, well, what do you mean? Can you please provide an analysis in these terms? Right, so this, this vision setting operates uh, at many different levels, um, all the way down to, to you know, the, the technical direction. All right, so that's articulate the vision. How did this work? Well, less successfully than sort of the first bit, um, I think, in general, the roadmap process has been really, really good. Um, I've, seen, I've seen at least two things come out of the roadmap process um, that made me really happy. One was volunteers saying to other volunteers, that's not on the roadmap. So it was like internalized into the community. People really took it seriously. Um, and it was no longer just the leadership's job to tell people you know, what the direction was. Um, but then also, some of these you know, diehard system hackers who really were trying to beat on one particular feature or whatever, when we laid out a roadmap, they said, hmm, I see, that makes sense. I really do want this feature, but you're right, for the success of the language, these are the things we need to be doing next. Right? So it did, it did really change some minds, it did set some boundaries. Um, nevertheless, like landing these ergonomics improvements in the language was a really, really hard lift um, and left some people, frankly, traumatized. Um, and we, we learned from those discussions as well, you know, and we're still iterating on the process. So it's not magic, right? Just articulating your values doesn't mean that everybody agrees with them, but it's a step. So the, the final era is where Rust is right now. Um, I should say, so we had a sort of major release of Rust, Rust 2018, that came out um, at the end of last year, uh, and in some sense was the capstone of all of this productivity work we've been doing. And so now the, the theme is, well, you know, we've made the language more productive, it's more usable, what we need now is to make it feel fully mature. So have a really solid library ecosystem that has all the things you expect, they're mature, they're documented, they're easy to use. Um, have Rust being used in you know, conservative and large companies, uh, and also get the tooling you know, uh, really shored up across the board, so IDE support, for example. Um, but there's another side to this maturity, which is Rust is being used in a lot of companies now. Um, like kind of all the big tech players are using Rust somehow, uh, except for Apple, um, or at least they won't admit it. Uh, but uh, as these tech giants have gotten more invested in Rust, they are starting to want to pay people to work on Rust, 
And so now we're facing another shift in who are the stakeholders, who's the audience, who's contributing, how do we balance these things, right? And some of these companies who shall remain nameless, but they are very big, uh, have a history of mm, sort of manipulating standards efforts, for example, <laughs> <laughs> by throwing a lot of bodies. Basically like, we're just gonna toss 20 engineers at this standards body, you better keep up, right? So we, this was something we're afraid of in Rust, right? We, we really value the community. We want, uh, we want to sort of keep a level playing field. Um, at the same time, we also desperately need to grow the size of the contributor base. So what I'm going to do now is step through a few different strategies we've used to on-ramp people um, you know, into the contribution process and then gradually mature them into leadership. Uh, but first, by contrast, here's the, here's the experience you get uh, if you want to contribute to Firefox. Good luck, <laughs> right? There's not, there hasn't been a lot of effort um, put into providing easy on-ramps to becoming a Firefox contributor, and that's partly because, you know, at this point, Mozilla just has, just pays all the people who do significant contributions. So, you know, as an employee, you can, you get whatever on-ramping you need, but as a volunteer, it's really hard, right? So that's, that was sort of <laughs> the state of the art um, at Mozilla. And what we've tried to do with Rust um, in the same sort of inclusive spirit is put a lot more work at every level of contribution. And again, I, I'm sure that many of you in Racket leadership, when you see this, are gonna be like, this is crazy. How can you spend this much time and effort uh, for this kind of this kind of thing, but we'll, we'll get there. So, you know, one thing we strive to do when we have open issues on our issue tracker is we have an expert write up in substantial detail uh, what is the issue, here are some guidelines for fixing it, I might even point you to some particular lines where you would need to make changes, and I, I kid you not, like, every time we have tried this, every time we write one of these down, within a day, we get somebody showing up who wants to contribute. And, you know, I'm not saying that each one of these people has gone on to become an amazing Rust contributor. Like, we definitely get just drive-by, oh, I, I checked off, you know, this particular box, but then I lost interest. But we have also attracted a lot of people who have become important this way, right? So this is a really, really easy on-ramp to contribution, which does take an upfront investment from an expert, but you know, if like, if you have a hundred of these and one percent yields a long-time contributor, that's actually really valuable. That's that's worth you know a few hours of time to write up one of these issues. Another example uh, is that we actually have a book about the Rust compiler. Um, it's not very complete yet, but what's there is quite good. So it, it has uh, chapters for every major module in the compiler. Uh, so you can go through this guide. It will sort of tell you both just the mechanics of how do you actually hack on the compiler? You know, what, what are the tools that you need? Where is the entry point? And then high level overviews of how different pieces work. And then in some cases, more, more detailed, um, issues. So I, I should say from a personal perspective, um, so I spent the last four years as a manager at Mozilla, mostly doing leadership uh, work and, and sort of tech leadership and not really hacking a lot. Um, but I got exhausted, as I alluded to before. Um, I've stepped down and I'm now doing compiler engineering, and this thing is saving my life. Like, compare, because I did a little bit of compiler hacking years ago when I first started, and it's really a night and day difference. Like, I feel so much more confident getting in, and I'm a paid employee. Right? So if you imagine just a volunteer out there on the internet, this kind of thing makes an enormous difference. Um, so there's also tooling like Bugs Ahoy, uh, basically ways to flag issues as being good beginner issues, ones where we've taken the time to, to write up what you need to get going. Okay, so all of those things focus on sort of one part of the ladder that contributors can climb, which is getting people engaged enough to write a couple pull requests. Then the question is, you know, to actually get return on this investment, we really need them to go further up the ladder and at least continue to contribute on their own, um, or ideally become leaders who 
you know, bring in additional contributors, and the cycle continues. So the way we've tried to approach that uh, is by creating this idea of working groups. So, so Rust has like a hierarchy of teams that I'll talk about later. Teams are about decision making. Working groups are about execution, basically. So by the, if you're getting involved in a working group, you're not debating over design questions so much anymore. You're just getting work done. Um, and so each working group has a designated leader. You might have a working group for, uh, for example, Rust has something called the borrow checker and we wanted to enhance it with something called non-lexical lifetimes. So we, we literally had a working group for non-lexical lifetimes. Um, Nico and uh, Felix Clock, who some of you know, uh, sort of co-led this group. And the idea, again, is it's a more structured version of what I was just showing you, um, a more persistent version, where, OK, we have this really exciting goal we're trying to reach. And you, too, can be part of this big feature for Rust. Here's how to get involved. And we, we start with that gentle on-ramp I talked about before, but with working groups, we have a way to sort of sustain um, that style of working, right? So we get people in with these easy PRs, but then we hook them up with mentors, with these leaders of the working group, who can then feed them one by one harder and harder things until, before you know it, they're contributing sort of at the same level as the leaders. Uh, similarly, like, <coughs> excuse me, um, I, I've sort of alluded to this already, but a really good technique here is if you have a piece of work that is fairly repetitive but not something easily automated, um, it works really well to write up detailed instructions about that uh, and then make a checklist that people can say, okay, I'm gonna take this module, I'm gonna take this module. People, people take it like catnip, it's amazing. Um, and so again, it's really important to make this successful that you give the right amount of guidance. Um, not literally doing all of the work, but doing maybe more than you would be inclined to when normally opening an issue. Um, another thing we found that's really helpful is, uh, you know, with these working groups that have uh, meetings either on text or sometimes through video, we, we record these things, we take minutes, we post them, so there's a trail that people can follow to get up to speed um, whenever they enter the working group. I also want to emphasize, um, you know, I've been focused a lot on technical design and code, but at the beginning I was talking about how Rust really cares about the whole experience. Um, you know, documentation, onboarding, what is the experience around the community, and so on. Uh, and so all of this team structure I'm talking about applies to these other kinds of things as well. So, for example, this triage and label issues, um, we now have an entirely volunteer team who just takes care of this for the project. Uh, I don't know who most of these people are, but they're awesome. Every issue that comes in gets tracked and routed to the right person. And we did this by building a team identity, making it appealing to people, like, I can be part of this, here's how I do it. And this, uh, this applies across the board. Okay, but the really hard thing, and this is the nut that I feel like we really haven't cracked yet, is how do you actually get people to become leaders? Which, you know, I think one reason that it's a hard nut to crack is that the skill set of a leader and the skill set of a hacker are pretty different. Um, not everybody is really poised to make that jump. Um, you know, and so that sort of leads to some question of, oh, maybe we need a separate ladder to enter leadership or something. I, I don't know, I'd love to hear ideas here. But I'll give you some of the things we've tried um, you know, to, to actually get these leaders to happen. So the most important thing is if you want someone to lead, you need to make space for them to do that leading. So I like to pick on Alex. Um, Alex is, uh, in some sense, the Matthew of, of Rust. Um, like, he maintains literally hundreds of libraries. Uh, he knows the compiler in and out. He's, everybody thinks he's a robot. He's an amazing guy. Um, I love him to death. Um, but this is actually a problem. Like, Alex is so productive and knows so much that there's no space for other people to get involved. And while for a while it was a real badge of pride for him to be so important to the maintenance of the project, eventually there came a turning point uh, where that was too much. And then we really had to scramble to figure out, you know, how to, how to spread the load. Uh, and so what we did was we turned part of the load 
Alex was carrying into two teams of people um, with like 20 people each. Uh, and they're doing, like, notice Alex is on both of these teams, but he does try to like not be super involved. Um, but this has been fantastic. Like it's taken us a while to get there, but just opening the space, just going from, oh, everybody ping Alex to, hey, we're trying to make uh, a team that's gonna look after the continuous integration infrastructure for Rust. Uh, please come join. You know, all of a sudden we have people whose full-time like actual job it is to do CI stuff or infrastructure stuff. They're like, oh, I'm not a language designer, but I know CI and I can contribute to Rust in that way. Uh, and I mean, now, like particularly on infrastructure, Alex is barely involved. Um, we have, you know, a student in Italy who has navigated a transition from Travis to Azure. Like, it's amazing. All of this stuff has, you know, has taken off. And the first step really was just opening up that space. Um, and then we were blown away by, by the level of response, um, how interested people were. Another aspect of opening space is, you know, having um, a hierarchy of teams that's ever expanding. And this, this really took us a long time to get comfortable with um, because it felt like we were creating an enormous bureaucracy. Um, it felt like we weren't gonna be able to move quickly. Um, but the truth is a programming language and its surrounding ecosystem is just enormous and it really deserves a huge staff uh, to do a good job. There's room for a lot of people, right? So this is a very partial list, but one of the ways that we represent our values is by having teams uh, sort of designated to represent those values, right? So we have, we have a language design team and a compiler team, but we also have a docs team and it has the same status in the project, right? It's at the same level in hierarchy, same, same with community running events and so on. Um, and again, and then the hierarchy within these, like creating working groups, et cetera, that's where we create space to bring more people in over time. So that's, we've had some successes with that. We've also struggled in some places, particularly around the, some of the more core technical pieces of Rust it's been hard to get people to bridge that gap between they left some comments on an RFC to they're really actively contributing to the language. Um, and this is one that we're still working on. Uh, I think the, you know, part of what we're trying to do right now is apply this working group model to design and not just code. So if we, for example, Rust, one of the big features we're trying to ship this year is async await notation in Rust. Uh, and it's been an extremely heated topic and people have gotten hurt. Like it's been a sort of mixed success. And in hindsight, we feel like if we had really designated a working group with a clear leadership structure from the beginning, a lot of the pain wouldn't have happened. Um, but it's, it's just, it's really hard to see how to do that when you're talking about pure design and not implementation work. Right, so that's kind of at the frontier of what we're doing now. Um, related to this, so Rust, as it continues to grow, there are ways that it becomes, you know, a victim of its own success. Um, and, you know, I think like, going back to the inclusivity stuff I was starting with, in the early days of Rust, inclusivity was extremely important because, you know, we were, we were doing something crazy um, we were doing something very ambitious. We needed everybody we could get in the project. But now that Rust is a thing that's really being adopted, uh, we have sort of the opposite problem. Um, and that's, that's also something that we're grappling with right now is, what if we have too much commentary, right? What if we have too many warm bodies? Like, how do we, how do we deal with this? Um, and, you know, one of the things that's frustrating about this is, it's not even clear frame, uh, flame war kind of stuff. Like some of these RFCs will get just high velocity comments and they're all pretty reasonable and civil, but it's nobody can keep up with that, right? Um, and in particular, nobody seems to want the job of managing the discussion. Uh, people wanna be in the discussion, but there's a lot of work to actually summarize and move forward a discussion and we haven't really figured out how to incentivize people to do that work. 
Um, but I think the aspiration here, um, there, there's an essay uh, from Michael Rogers, Maintainer versus Community, that talks about burnout in open source and sustainability in open source. It's, it's really interesting. And I think this quote really resonates, which is, you know, the only way as your, as your product grows in adoption, your open source product, the only way to keep it sustainable is to turn that adoption into a funnel of contribution. Um, and that contribution, of course, has to be more than code. It has to be leadership, um, scribes, summarization, et cetera. All right. Um, so this, this section was kind of all about the path to leadership, um, trying to have that clear ladder. And this, again, has been a mixed success. The working groups that are focused on code, I would say we have probably mm, like a 60 to 70% hit rate in terms of mm, the work produced by the working group was more than just what the leaders were doing. Um, and then in those cases where we have had success, the members, uh, the volunteers in the working group have gone on to become really important contributors to the compiler. But we also have plenty of working groups that just never really got off the ground um, or where they finished their task and they just kind of dispersed. So it's definitely not a magic wand, but it is something. Um, as I've emphasized, uh, the, the thing that we just really can't seem to figure out is how to get people to do leadership. Um, I, I guess, like, in a way it's not surprising, volunteering to write code feels a lot different than volunteering to manage people. Um, but I don't know. So that, that's a nut we're still trying to crack. And then a, a big thing I haven't talked about too much here, but is really on our minds right now, as we create this sprawling bureaucracy and try to subdivide and decentralize so that um, people aren't blocked on each other, you know, that's, that's great in terms of getting stuff done, but there's a risk that we lose the coherence uh, that we cared about at the beginning. And so finding the right balance between, oh, we'll just spin off more and more working groups and they'll do their thing, versus, well, we have seasoned team leaders who are sort of gatekeeping the decisions. Like, how do you strike that balance so that nobody's blocked, but you're not making bad decisions? So I, I have some thoughts on that I can, I can talk offline about, um, but that's, that's one of the current challenges. All right, um, so we're, we're pretty much at the end here. Uh, as I said, you know, this, I don't at all claim that we have all the answers, even for the Rust community, let alone any other community. Um, and of course, one approach that we're taking now is we have a governance working group uh, to try to work on these problems. Um, and, you know, they've been surveying other communities um, and uh, technology solutions and so on. And, you know, if this is interesting to you, the cool thing about all these working groups is they're easy to find. Uh, and if you go to the homepage here, you'll, you know, there's an on-ramp. You can find out a lot about what the current thinking is around governance. Uh, right, so to sort of summarize the, the key takeaways from the talk, right, there, there are these three things that I think uh, any community, any open source community, really needs to think hard about, you know, find their own answers to. So first of all, how do you deal with the why wasn't I consulted problem? Um, you know, do you, do you decide you just don't care to consult with certain people? You know, what, what's your take? Um, can you try to herd cats by articulating a compelling vision that resonates emotionally and gets people itching the way you want them to itch? Uh, and do you have a clear ladder and pipeline for leadership so it's not, you know, just one or two important dudes who, if they were to leave the project, the whole thing would fall apart, but you actually have this flowing pipeline of, of people coming in taking up leadership. Um, and I'll close with a, a quote from my good friend Yehuda Katz, which is that open source is about channeling chaos, right? You're never gonna control everything. People are gonna show up, sometimes with good stuff, sometimes with bad stuff. You, you kinda have to live with it. Um, but these are all techniques you can use to try to productively channel that chaos into you know, a product. So, thank you. <laughs> We have time for questions. So how do you make hard decisions when people disagree? Like you, you said you have articulated the trade-offs, but obviously people have 
can have very different views on which of those trade-offs are important. Uh, and what's, how do you deal with the f difficulty of making tough decisions there? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think there are two different cases of difficult decisions that tend to come up. Um, one is a case where there's a disagreement between the team that it oversees the decision and the broader community, um, which you can see by sort of the, the, just the vibe of the comment thread. You can get a sense that like, oh, this is not just one or two people who are uncomfortable. This is a big su subset of the community. And in those cases, uh, basically we ask the team to engage more with the community and try to really thoroughly document what are the concerns being raised, how are they being addressed, and so on. So we get more and more detailed um, about how we see things. And usually that has resulted in either the team understanding that, oh, the community was onto something, we were, we were about to you know, do something bad, um, or the community sort of changes course, right? So, so basically, let me put it another way. I, there's no case in Rust um, that I can think of where we have landed a decision where a strong subset of the community was vocally in disagreement, that we just don't do that. The, the harder case um, is when there's disagreement within the team, and that's one that we're still working on. Um, and it, in the early days, this didn't happen very much, or like if people had objections, they generally trusted each other and would stand down. Um, but in the last year or so, we've had more cases where people are basically blocking um, decisions from being made. So, so for, for the team to make a decision, there has to be consensus on that team. Um, and so that, that has broken down. And that's one of the things we're working on right now on can we, can we try to formalize it more in terms of other team members can say, you haven't fully explored the trade-offs, you haven't fully taken this into account, versus you don't agree with my values, right? So if we can, let's take the async await thing, for example. A structure we're thinking about is if we had a designated working group who had a leader from the team, one person who was kind of the directly responsible person, in some sense, that person gets to make the calls, but the team is there as a check to make sure that they have taken into account all of the feedback and trade-offs. Um, so that, that's kind of where we're headed, um, but that, that situation is really tough when, it, when there's disagreement within the team. Hi, Aaron. Uh, I've been involved in open source projects for 20 years, some of which involved a lot of money moving around, some of which involved small money, a lot of which involved no money. And I wonder if you could talk about that issue here, because mm. it seems to me that Rust is first and foremost a technology asset for Mozilla. That's part of what makes it good. Um, and I wonder how that affects uh, both, I mean, take whatever question you want, your willingness or ability to invest in certain a level of engagement with the community. Is it, in, in a way, a tax that you pay the community them that are sincere? And how does this affect people in the community? Is their level of contribution relative to the, actually, financial value they get? Because they say, hey, it's worth something to me. Of course I'm going to contribute. When you say, find leaders, it's like, well, of course you can't, because managing other people sounds like something you should get paid for, whereas <laughs> right. writing code, that's fun, I'll do a little bit of that. Right, so exactly. take whatever you want out of that. Yeah, yeah, great questions. Um, so in the, in the early, in the run-up to 1.0, the question of the relationship between Mozilla and Rust um, was talked about a lot in the community, and people, when people didn't like the decisions that leaders were making, they could trot out accusations that you're only doing this because you work at Mozilla and you're doing this for the good of Mozilla. Um, but the truth is, we, you know, for better or worse, so um, there's a, a guy, again, some of you know Dave Herman, who, who sort of oversaw um, a lot of this research work. One of the things he did early on was set up a, a culture of isolation, basically, that the Rust team was not really influenced by the rest of Mozilla. Um, we tried really hard not to see Mozilla as our sole customer or especially important customer, but really like look at the community as a whole. And part of the way that we eventually gained people's trust was just to expand all of these leadership teams to include lots of non-Mozilla people. 
right? So it was a big day when the core team was no longer majority Mozilla staff, for example. Um, and these days, we have, you know, I, I alluded to all these big players in tech, like, you know, Google and Facebook and Amazon and so on. All, literally all of them have people paid to work on Rust, and we fit them into this team structure. So it's been a, it's been a process, um, uh, and we, you know, I think a lot of what I've been talking about in terms of listening and decision making is how we got people to trust that it wasn't all about Mozilla, that they really had a say in the language. And this has made an impact on places like Google, uh, you know, when, when they started picking up Rust, so, so they have an operating system, Fuchsia, um, that uses Rust in a pretty heavy way, and they basically said, okay, so to make sure that we have a good stake uh, in this language, what we need to do is get people onto the teams. Um, and they've done that, right? So we provided like a clear path for people to have a say. There is one other money-related thing, which is people often ask for a foundation. Um, there are lots of companies who want to give money to Rust, and it's complicated for various reasons. Uh, we have shied away from that because the idea of having a, a central pool where all this money is flowing into, and then that, that central organization is trying to decide who to dole it out to, that sounds like trouble, <laughs> you know? Uh, and lots of foundations have had trouble with that. And so we've preferred to have more of a, hey, if you want to contribute to Rust, hire somebody at your company to do the things that you want, right? You don't need to do some central thing. You are empowered. Garrett, let's thank Aaron again. <laughs>